available. Um, so I think I, it's eight o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Hey, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, leadership during a crisis seminar uh, from AMSSM. I apologize that we're two weeks late, but I'm very excited about our panel. You'll see everybody here. I got Joe Doty and Dean Taylor, both from Duke. And Angie Arnell is a, a colleague of mine at Uniform Services University. We uh, have a plan for this evening. We actually have 35 minutes of taped lectures between myself, Angie, and Dr. Taylor. Uh, Joe Doty is then going to go live. He's going to talk about mindfulness. And after that, we're going to be addressing questions and have a discussion with the group. We're open-ended. We have actually up until, I believe, about 9.30 Eastern time. But at the same time, we're going to be watching the questions and answering them as well. Uh, so we'll try to keep pace. Uh, and with that, we'll go ahead and start. So Andy, if you can hear me, if we can start that video, we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see, and here we go. Good evening, I'm Dr. Fran O'Connor and I would like to welcome you to this AMSSM webinar event on crisis leadership. It's an absolute privilege to be asked by the AMSSM board to create a webinar event during these challenging times. I'm currently a professor in the Department of Military and Emergency Medicine at Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences and Medical Director of the Consortium for Health and Military Performance, or CHAMP. Most importantly, I'm a past president of AMSSM. I have nothing to disclose other than that I continue to work for the Department of Defense. All the opinions of myself and my colleagues, Dr. Yarnell, Dr. Taylor, and Dr. Doty, are not representative of the organizations we work for and are solely our own. In addition, this presentation this evening is not an endorsement of the AMSSM or any literature or textbooks that I'm gonna reference herein. The learning objectives for this evening's webinar are as follows. Number one, to describe the terminology of leadership and crisis management. To next, identify characteristics of the effective physician leader in a crisis. And finally, to discuss the impact of stress and strategies to cope. After my introductory lecture on crisis leadership, Dr. Angela Yarnell will be speaking about stress and its impact on performance. Dr. Yarnell is a research psychologist with the United States Army. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Military and Emergency Medicine at Uniformed Services University. She additionally serves as the deputy professor of military science. Following Dr. Yarnell, we'll next hear from Dr. Dean Taylor about emotional intelligence. Dr. Taylor is a professor of orthopedic surgery and director of Duke Sports Medicine Fellowship at Duke University Medical Center. In addition, he has roles as the director of the School of Medicine Leadership Education and Development Curriculum and the chairman of the Fagan Leadership Program inside of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Perhaps most importantly, Dean is a classmate of mine from West Point and a retired colonel from the United States Army. Finally, and before questions, we're gonna hear from Dr. Joe Doty. Uh, Joe is gonna be addressing the webinar in reference to mindfulness. Joe is currently the executive director of the Fagan Leadership Program at Duke University. He's an assistant professor of the leadership curriculum at the Duke School of Medicine. He's also a graduate of the United States Military Academy and a retired army officer. We are currently in a horrific pandemic, and I would argue that the country clearly turns to its medical professionals when confronted by such a challenge. Here you see images that the country, unfortunately, is all too familiar with. This is the SARS virus, the HIV virus, Ebola, H1N1, and of course, the coronavirus. I would additionally argue that the country and the political leaders turn to medical experts because as leaders, they offer the country hope. In thinking about this presentation for the AMSSM membership, in particular in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, I thought I could best embody the principles of crisis leadership with the acronym of HOPE, honesty, optimism, professionalism, and empathy. HOPE is clearly the medical crisis leadership deliverable. I would like to first briefly share some physician leadership background literature I had intended to highlight at our annual meeting in Atlanta during our leadership seminar. The first point I would like to make this evening with this brief literature review is to emphasize how important it is that we recognize that physicians are leaders. This article appeared in the Harvard Business Review in 2018, 
written by Dr. Lisa Rottenstein and addressed the issue of why physicians need leadership. In this review, Dr. Rottenstein had several key points, including that there is strong evidence that effective leadership can make a difference in healthcare outcomes. And two, additional evidence exists that effective leadership can have impact on physician well-being and serve to mitigate physician burnout. Most importantly, she identified that to be a physician is to lead. The second point I wanted to emphasize from the literature is that we need to train future leaders of teams. In this second article, Fritch et al. performed a systematic review of existing physician leadership programs, what they entail, and what gaps may currently exist. They specifically noted that the majority of leadership programs focus on enhancing the skills of the individual and that the major educational gap was the lack of development of leaders who fully understand collaboration. What we need to build is future leaders of teams. Physician leadership, let's first review some of the key terminology in the literature. Let's first define what leadership actually is. In our military medicine and leadership development program at Uniformed Services University, we define leadership using three fundamental constructs of human psychology. It's an important definition, so I would like to take the time to read it for emphasis. Leadership is how a leader influences individuals and groups by enhancing behaviors or actions, cognitions, which are perceptions, thoughts, and beliefs, and motivations, why we act and think as we do, to achieve goals that benefit the individuals and groups. The key here is to enhance behaviors, cognitions, and motivations to achieve team goals. It then follows with what our definition of the leader is. Leaders are aspirational, setting the vision and goals. They are inspirational. They drive these processes and remove barriers for individuals and teams to achieve their united goals. Military and civilian leaders can operate in three unique domains. Strategic, this is the 30,000 foot view where the leader is developing the themes of the mission. Operational, closer to the ground, here the leader is focusing more on management, synchronizing team efforts to execute the mission. Finally, the tactical, the function of the team on the ground with the practical issues of direct patient care. A classic sports medicine scenario is seen in this rugby injury example that was shared with me earlier by Lieutenant General Eric Schoomaker, who actually observed this injury. Here you see the scrum starting to take shape with the hooker in the middle. The scrum is carefully assembled, guided by, guided by the referee, because if done wrong, an injury can occur. Here you see a fracture dislocation in the hooker that takes place, and this is where the physician excels tactically in fixing the fracture. But when the physician notes the trend, publishes, and facilitates rule changes that are operating strategically, this is where the physician can have the greatest strategic impact. A medical crisis. How do we define it? This is the current Department of Defense COVID-19 clinical practice guideline. Embedded in the document is a matrix that outlines for the physician where, dependent upon demands and resources, the conventional transitions to contingency and then on to a crisis. As transition occurs, decision-making for the clinician leadership team changes. Dr. Thomas Kolditz, a retired Brigadier General in the United States Army and a former chair, Behavioral Science and Leadership Department at West Point, researched and published this incredible read on crisis leadership. His research was based upon his study of leaders in extreme sports, such as parachuting, SWAT teams, combat teams, and of course, medical teams. Dr. Kolditz defines the crisis simply as a situation where followers perceive their lives are threatened. He then follows with a definition of crisis leadership. I define extremist leadership as giving purpose, motivation, and direction to people when there is imminent physical danger and followers believe leader behavior will influence their physical well-being or survival. What are the characteristics of the effective crisis physician leader? Here again, we see our CHAMP acronym that I believe provides a useful construct to rally behind as a leader when confronted by a crisis situation. Honesty, optimism, professionalism, empathy, hope. Let's first address honesty. 
During 2005 and 2006, I had an opportunity to serve as a Special Operations Command Surgeon directly supporting then Major General Frank Kearney. In a year working with Special Operations, I learned that the cornerstone of leadership is trust. Importantly, trust is earned and comes principally through integrity. What is integrity? Simply stated, it's doing what you say you are going to do. Clearly, the cornerstone of leadership is trust. And when we talk about integrity, the most important pillar of that attribute is honesty. That being stated, we all make mistakes, and it's critically important to be honest with your mistakes. The effective leader accepts accountability and responsibility for mistakes. Learn to forgive yourself for your mistakes, but remember, and don't make the same mistake twice. General Dan Allen is another West Point classmate who I invited to Uniform Services University when he was then Vice Chief of Staff of the United States Army to address our medical students. And I'll never forget an exchange Dan had with our students during a discussion period. One student asked Dan, sir, what mistakes that you have made serve to shape your leadership style? Dan took all of 10 seconds to shape an answer and he came back with the following. You want me to start from this morning and work backwards. Clearly, honesty is the backbone of integrity and the cornerstone of trust. Let's next look at optimism. Another great read is General Colin Powell's book, It Worked For Me. He has 13 rules of life, but I would bring your attention to the last. Perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. This is important not only in yourself, but you also need to surround yourself with a team of optimists. Yes, we want honesty in the group, but we want to avoid the pessimists. Throughout my career, I've had an opportunity to interact and work with a number of great leaders, and optimism is consistently a trait that ranks at the top. This scene from Apollo 13 captures the importance of optimism. The two gentlemen on the left are discussing their concerns that this will easily be the worst space disaster in NASA's history. When the flight director, Gene Krantz, interjects, With all due respect, sir, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. Certainly this captures an incredible moment in optimism. Position leadership, let's next look at professionalism. Professionals define a unique group in American society. Professionals have specialized skills, specialized privileges, but that's also accompanied by great responsibility and accountability. This is an excellent article from a Kaiser Permanente journal that identifies six characteristics of what defines a professional. They are excellence, accountability, altruism, humanitarianism, respect for others, honor, and integrity. But when you boil it all down, these characteristics underscore that physicians lead by serving. Being a physician is to be a servant leader. I want to reinforce the importance of team building. This is a third great leadership book that I would like to recommend this evening. Team of Teams, written by General Stanley McChrystal. In the book, General McChrystal describes how the greatest army was getting beat day in and day out by a foe that didn't have a fraction of the technology or firepower. What he discovered was the organization was siloed and was failing to communicate rapidly to make effective decisions on the battlefield. He found what we frequently observe in medicine, that failure points are danger exists when there are interfaces or handoffs in communication. What he did to enhance communication among teams was to co-locate one member of a team with a second team, creating a more effective team of teams. This strategy turned the tide in the Middle East as the communication interface became more efficient. Let's next uh, transition to empathy. There is fear with the coronavirus, and rightfully so. Being a healthcare worker on the front lines has been identified as a vulnerable group. We need to recognize that individuals are fearful, under stress, and have unique coping mechanisms. We need to demonstrate empathy, understand the value of rest and resilience, and leverage strategic pauses for individuals who need time to regroup before they can come back to the fight. Final thoughts. I wanna go back to Dr. Kolditz's text. In his extensive study of extremist leaders, he queried followers as to what they found to be the most critical element of the successful leader. 
he found that the characteristic that consistently rose to the top was continuous learning, specifically the ability to perceive, learn, and adapt. In extremist leaders embrace learning for continuous problem solving. Just as in Apollo 13, every crisis creates opportunity, and this concept is expressed in JFK's description of crisis. When written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger, and the other represents opportunity. I think all of us can sense the tremendous change occurring in medicine as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The way we practice medicine will never be the same. Finally, I want to conclude with a comment from yet another West Point classmate, General James McConville, the current Chief of Staff of the Army. I asked our, uh, General McConville for a specific comment to the position members of AMSSM, which I'd like to read. We're in a war against the virus. The heroes in this fight will be the doctors, the nurses, and scientists. My job as a leader is to get them into the fight with required resources. We will kill the virus. We will prevail because winning matters. I want to thank you for joining this webinar this evening. I hope you enjoy the remaining presentations and I look forward to our discussion period. Thank you. We hear a lot about stress in our society and exposure to various stressors is a ubiquitous occupational hazard. Therefore, as leaders, it's important to understand the impact of stress on our health and performance and further recognize effects of stress in those we lead. This session is designed to address the potential effects of stress during a crisis and ways to mitigate that stress for ourselves and others. We will first discuss the important role of leaders during stress and crisis. Then we'll cover the impact of stress on performance and finally, consider ways to manage stress. The importance of leadership during stress or crisis may be best demonstrated in military examples, where due to the military's hierarchical nature, quality of life for service members is highly dependent on leadership. In this population, strong leadership is significantly correlated with improved morale and cohesion, fewer mental health problems, and fewer ethical violations. In combat, leaders who exhibit positive behaviors, such as clear thinking, while not displaying negative behaviors, such as showing favoritism, help to reduce effects of combat exposures. Leaders must be flexible in their decision-making and intentional in communications with others. To be an effective leader, one must adapt to stress. And in order to do that, we first must understand why and how stress affects our performance. One of the only laws of psychology explains the relationship between arousal and performance. In the early 20th century, scientists discovered that rats learned mazes best with a moderate amount of arousal. Too little arousal and the rats were not motivated to learn anything. Too much arousal and the rats were too stressed to encode the complicated pattern and run the maze. This relationship is considered a law by many psychologists because it's been found over and over again in various species, including humans, with multiple forms of arousal across domains of performance. The yerkes dotson or optimal arousal effect is represented by an inverted U-shaped function. This relationship can be used to predict how stress will affect performance in many contexts. As arousal or stress level increases, so does performance to the extent that the body is responding positively to the stress. When stress is high, continual, or surpasses the individual's ability to cope, performance begins to decline. While this relationship reliably exists between arousal and performance, the scale at which stress begins to exceed coping resources differs between individuals. Many factors seem to contribute to this threshold. These factors include genetics, prenatal environment, childhood stress, personality, and resilience. The difficulty of a task also contributes to differences in peak arousal levels. Simple tasks, for example, may still be completed under higher amounts of stress, whereas difficult tasks may be affected by lower amounts of stress. So how is performance affected by high arousal or stress? Well, stress affects our thoughts, feelings, or motivations, and our behaviors. 
Specifically, stress can decrease our cognitive capacity or ability to think clearly. Increased arousal forces black and white thinking, which limits our ability to integrate more than one perspective or point of view. Our ability to make good decisions, think critically, or be creative is hindered. These cognitive capacities are crucial as a leader. High stress that creates this narrowed thinking must be managed. Stress also impacts our emotions and motivation. Being aware of and regulating emotions of self and others is difficult in general, but it's particularly difficult under conditions of stress when it's arguably most important to get it right. Given that most interpersonal interactions are likely to take place for a leader under stressful conditions, it's important to understand how the experience of stress interferes with one's ability to effectively manage emotions of self and others. For example, the experience of stress decreases the capacity for attending to people around you. This reduced capacity can intensify the attention paid to self at the expense of attending to the emotions of others. A resulting overemphasis on one's own emotions can create a distorted view of the emotions of others and reduce the effectiveness of any ensuing interpersonal interaction. A leader should learn how certain stressful situations affect them and what their reactions look like at that kind of time. To accomplish this task, the leader needs to reflect on their emotions, reactions, and behaviors and try to understand how they contributed to the situation. You might ask yourself, what is my part in creating this situation? What did I do that seemed right? And what might I need to change for the future? This type of reflection is key to managing emotions under stress. The emotions of those we lead will also be impacted by stress. Decreased motivation in crisis can be difficult to manage, but as leaders, we can focus on ways to reduce stress for ourselves and others as a way to mitigate this impact. Capacity to recognize and regulate emotions in self and others is called emotional intelligence. This concept will be addressed in detail in a follow-on presentation. With regard to behaviors, it's well established that dominant responses become exaggerated under stress. A dominant response is the most likely response to a given situation, which can be correct or incorrect for that situation, depending on knowledge, skills, and practice. If a response is not well learned or rehearsed, then the experience of stress will lead to poor performance on that task. Conversely, if a response is well learned and rehearsed, then increased arousal can further facilitate the appropriate response. As a leader, you must understand your dominant response under stress. And if that response is inappropriate in some way or otherwise ineffective, you'll need to identify a more correct way to act and respond. Then practice this action and work to increase your skills under stress for better results. Other behavioral considerations relevant to stress include the fact that health-harming behaviors like smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol are exacerbated by stress, while health-promoting behaviors like good diet, regular exercise, and adequate sleep are decreased by stress. Later, we'll discuss ways that focusing on increasing health-promoting behaviors can reduce stress. But first, let's take a closer look at the stress process. Stress is a psychobiological process that begins with the perception of a threat or challenge in the form of physical or psychological stimuli. One's perception of stress, reaction to it, and the physical toll it takes on the body are contingent on how a stimulus is perceived and whether or not resources are available for coping. The cognitive process of appraisal describes the way our brains use our own personal experience and memories of the stimuli to determine the threat level and potentially see it as a challenge instead or downgrade it altogether. Our brains also evaluate whether or not we have the physical or psychological resources to cope with the stressor. This mental assessment can alter our perceptions of and reactions to stress. Understanding appraisal is key to managing our stress because it suggests that we have power over the process and that we can develop the capacity to positively adapt to our stress and crisis situations. Managing stress and enhancing well-being can be achieved through increasing certain health-promoting behaviors, cognitions, and motivations. 
And we can think of managing our stress like managing our bank account, in this case, our wellness bank. Stressors in our environment and our responses to them are like making withdrawals. And so if we know that we're going into an occupation or a situation in which we'll experience stress, then we should focus on making deposits. In physical, psychological, and spiritual health to contribute to our wellness. Deposits like regular exercise, healthy nutrition, good sleep, practicing spirituality and seeking a sense of purpose, increasing our mindfulness and awareness, practicing optimism and gratitude, and seeking out social support are all ways that we can work to make deposits in increasing our overall well-being. That way, when the stress comes, we'll be better equipped to deal with it. As leaders, we can role model these practices for our followers and team members, encourage them to join us, and even when possible, affect our working environments to support these practices. Stress is an inevitable part of life and work. Understanding this process, our responses, and how to manage our stress sets us up as leaders to be effective and to do the same for those we lead. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be part of this AMSSM webinar with Fran and, and Eric and Neil. Uh, thank you for having me. These are my disclosures, none of which uh, pertain to this uh, presentation. Uh, probably the more important disclosure is that I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And you say, what the hell is an orthopedic surgeon doing here talking to us about emotional intelligence? What do surgeons know about emotional intelligence? Well, I'd have to agree with you. About uh, 20 years ago, I had not the first clue what emotional intelligence was. I knew it was about emotions and I wasn't very intelligent about it. Uh, and that's about the extent of my knowledge. In fact, I can think back to a time in my operating room uh, at West Point where I had no emotional intelligence. Uh, um, we had a young scrub tech in the room and he had contaminated the field and, and I reacted by screaming and yelling at him and throwing him out of the room and, and completely losing my composure and, and temper, all in the name of uh, taking care of the patient and being safe for the patient, doing what was right for the patient. Uh, I'm embarrassed about it now uh, because I'm sure that had a, an adverse effect on, on the growth of, of that young man and, and uh, it was not the way that uh, we should behave in our operating rooms and it was a bad example for all there and uh, like I said, I'm very embarrassed about that now when I think back on it. Well, I've learned a lot since then and uh, 15 years ago I came to Duke and uh, thought that I knew a little bit about leadership and, and I'd like to uh, develop some leadership education programs for those in healthcare and medicine. Uh, and along the way, we developed programs for leadership for our fellows in orthopedic sports medicine. Uh, we developed something called the Fagan Leadership Program to honor John Fagan. Uh, that's an in-depth leadership development experience for medical students and residents and fellows. And we developed a longitudinal curriculum in leadership for the medical students of the Duke University School of Medicine. We've learned a lot about uh, leadership and, and I personally have learned a lot. And, and I've also learned that we need to have a framework uh, to be able to teach uh, learners how to learn to be more effective leaders. And uh, we've done the research uh, to identify what are the important uh, principles and competencies for effective leadership in healthcare. And the core principle of patient-centeredness patient really jumps out, and that's why it's at the center of the model. And then the core competencies are intentionally placed around patient-centeredness as interwoven competency. They're intentionally placed uh, because of their importance and because of what they mean. Integrity and selfless service are foundational competencies, so they're at the base of the model. Teamwork and critical thinking hold that leadership together, and they're the framework of the model on the sides. And emotional intelligence, what we're talking about today, uh, that's really the most important competency. It's at the keystone. It holds all the other competencies together. 
and I think it's it, it's the essence of what an effective ethical leader in healthcare needs to understand and exhibit uh, if they're going to be effective. Like I said, I didn't know much about emotional intelligence. I've learned a lot in the last 15 years. The definition that we use for emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize and understand thinking and emotions in yourself and others. In other words, awareness. Uh, and to use this awareness to effectively manage your behavior and relationships. It's about awareness and behavior. For me, in my simple thinking, uh, I like to think of it in a two by two matrix. It's about understanding yourself and others, and it's about your behaviors uh, and how you manage yourself and how you manage your relationships with others. In other words, it's about self awareness and self management. And it's about social awareness, which includes empathy. And Fran's going to talk a little bit about this uh, later on. Uh, and it's about relationship management, your behaviors that affect your relationships with others. So in times of crisis, is emotional intelligence important? Uh, is leadership important? Certainly, we see great leaders out there. and and. Uh, they are acting with these competencies. So, of course, it's important. Uh, I think there is a tendency, though, for all of us in times of crisis to lean towards self-interest. And if we're not intentional, intentional about thinking about our selfless service and thinking about emotional intelligence and teamwork and critical thinking and integrity, uh, then we can lose our, our focus on things that make us effective leaders. And emotional intelligence, if we think about that and we understand that we need to manage ourselves and our relationships with others, uh, that's gonna help get us through most crises so that we don't lose uh, that effective leadership. Just look at all the empty uh, toilet paper shelves in, in your uh, grocery stores. Uh, there is a tendency towards self-interest as those are trying to hoard toilet paper and other supplies. Uh, but by being intentional about our role as leaders, I think we know, can overcome that tendency to, towards self-interest. I'd like to share you a, a little story uh, that exhibits my experience and, and how I feel that um, you can learn to be more emotionally intelligent and you can learn to be a better leader. This is a case that uh, happened about five years ago. In fact, five years ago last week uh, in my operating room. It was the first case of the day. We had our normal team uh, plus a second year resident that was with us uh, really for uh, the first time. Uh, we were doing an ACL reconstruction, medial meniscus repair. He started the case. We let him start doing the arthroscopy. Uh, I was observing. I rested my elbow on the Mayo stand. And all of a sudden, I thought I'd been electrocuted. Um, I screamed out a couple of expletives, jumped back, uh, and then when the elbow fell, and when the, the scalpel fell out of my elbow and hit the ground, um, I knew that my ulnar nerve had been injured. Uh, and through that small poke hole, uh, an 11 blade had cut my ulnar nerve. Well, uh, at that time, all the things I'd learned about emotional intelligence kicked in. Um, remarkably, I looked around the room and I was aware, socially aware of everybody else in the room and they were scared of what was gonna happen next. I also was aware of my own emotions and understood that self-pity, uh, I understood that blame, I understood that anger and, and screaming was not gonna be effective in this situation. Uh, and I was able to manage uh, those emotions effectively and build a relationship with everybody in the room to say, okay, I'm okay. We're going to clean this up. We're going to take care of the patient. We've already started this operation. There's no one else available. We're going to get this case done. And we did. Uh, and then four hours later, uh, my own surgery on my own elbow was taking place. And through that small poke hole, there was a complete laceration of my ulnar nerve held together only by a small strand of epineurium. Uh, it was repaired through a group fascicular repair. Uh, and then I went on to heal 
and have been back in surgery uh, after about a 13, 14 month hiatus. Uh, I tell that story because if I hadn't had the emotional intelligence, we wouldn't have had a successful outcome for that patient, and we wouldn't have had a successful uh, outcome for everybody in that room. And we all took care of each other, and I made sure that we took care of that resident. Uh, I understood uh, that his second uh, victim trauma uh, could be devastating. And we made sure that we brought everybody on the team together uh, and we all learned from that experience and shared that experience together as a team so that others could learn from it. So I think that the important thing about emotional intelligence is that it can be learned uh, and that it's important for effective leadership, uh, both in your daily challenges and especially in times of crises like the current pandemic or your own personal crises like I've shown you today. Thank you very much and uh, we'll go on to the next speaker. Good evening, good evening everybody. Uh, I'm Joe Doty, I'm live. At the risk of being live, I'm live. Um, before we start talking about mindfulness, uh, what I'd like to do is um, invite you to practice some mindfulness. So we're gonna take about two or three minutes, wherever you are, and uh, please join me in uh, uh, practicing um, the skill. Um, so the first thing I'd like you to do is I'd simply like to invite you to uh, close your eyes. Take a deep breath in. And let it out. And now I'd like to invite you to bring your awareness to your heart. Think about your heart. Now I want you to move your awareness to your feet, specifically the bottom of your feet. What are they feeling? If you're standing, are they feeling more pressure than they would be if you were sitting? Now just focus on your left foot. Just your left foot. Now bring your focus to your white to your right foot. Now keep your focus there. One of the things that could be happening while we're focusing in these different areas is that your mind could, could be starting to wander. And so I just challenge you as it starts to wander to go other places. I challenge you to keep it focused on where we're talking about. Bring your focus now back to your breathing. See if you can't slow down your breathing a little bit. Be very intentional about what you're thinking about. Breathing in. Breathing out. 
if the mind's wandering, if you'd like to, bring it back to your breathing. Now let's move to your shoulders. See if you can feel the garment as it's resting on your shoulders, your shirt, a coat, whatever it is. Feel that. Be aware of the garment on your shoulders. Is it tight? Is it loose? Is it heavy? Is it light? Let's just go left shoulder. Just the left. If your mind's drifting, if you'd like to, bring it back to your left shoulders. Let's go right. What is that right one feeling like now? Can you feel the garment? Can you feel the cloth all over it? Let's bring it back to the center now and back to your breathing. If your mind is wandering, if you'd like to, bring it back to your breathing. We're going to take one more real deep breath in. Let it out. And let's come back as a group. Thank you. Thank you for doing that if you did. If you didn't, that's okay. Um, Mindfulness is a skill. Mindfulness is a skill. Being present is a skill. Um, this is kind of a rehash, a purposely rehashing what Dr. Taylor was talking about. Um, I like to say that mindfulness is a synonym for self-awareness. Um, if you're practicing the skill of self-awareness, you are uh, you are intentionally and purposely being cognizant of your thinking and of your emotions. You're pra you're practicing being present. Now, notice how I have not said anything about what you're doing with that, which gets into self-management. Mindfulness is simply awareness. Awareness, awareness, awareness. Um, one of the gurus of mindfulness, John Kabat Zinn, this is his definition. Paying attention in a particular way right now on purpose which could be a synonym for intentionality. And in the present moment, we're going to come back to that in a moment. Non-judgmentally, we can talk, we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a little bit also. That gets into whenever I was, whenever we were doing our exercise and I said, well, if your mind's wandering, I, I was specific in saying, if you want, if you want to bring it back to your breathing or whatever, you can do that, but you don't have to. So that's why it, it was being, I was purposely being non-judgmental. Here's another definition. Arguably that they look almost exactly the time, exactly the same, full attention, present moment. There's that word again without judgment, awareness, awareness, awareness. 
So, this is a question for the group. I've asked this question in a lot of different settings, and uh, sometimes I get funny looks. Uh, sometimes I get smirks, laughs. Um, it's a serious question. Um, maybe put your answers in the chat or um, anybody have any thoughts? When is it not right now? When is it not the present moment? Fran, you want to answer? No? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Come on, this is not a trick question. I don't know why. I, maybe I think I word this question wrong. When is it not now? When is it not the present moment? I would imagine it's, it's always the present moment. Thank you. That's exactly right. It's not, there's, it's not a trick question. It's, it's exactly. Thank you, Devin. Never. <laughs> Devin, you win the prize for the evening. Um, it's always right now. And so, and that's problematic for, that could be a very problematic, uh, simplistic knowledge. Um, it's always right now. And so you go back to those. So, so we zip back to the, one of those definitions, paying attention in a particular way right now, on purpose, in the present moment. So if you think about mindfulness from a skill perspective, from a skill perspective, I mean, it's tomorrow is not right now. Tomorrow is tomorrow. You can think about, I'm answering Hamid's question. You can start thinking about tomorrow right now, but it's not tomorrow. It's still right now. Um, that's a good answer, though. So anyways, paying attention to a particular moment right now. And so back to when can you not practice this? When can you not be present and mindful? Um, the answer is if you choose to if you choose to do it intentionally, you can always be. And this is the, that's the skill. Um, so this is kind of my definition. Intentionality thinking and emotions. And this is where it ties into to, to uh, self-awareness. The quality of the con the, the quality of the attention and contact given to something or someone. And so now I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to briefly, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about what Angie talked about. Angie, because Angie, I didn't really need to give my pitch tonight because Angie covered everything in my pitch, quite frankly. Nicely done, Angie. No, it was great. Um, the, uh, um, she talked about leaders need to reflect. She specifically said that they need to re reflect on their thinking and on their emotions. <laughs> That's that's being present and mindful. That's doing it intentionally. Uh, she talked about making deposits. She specifically said, in, when she was describing the stress process, she she specifically said, once the stressors are perceived, her words. So what if the stressors are not perceived what if the stressors are not perceived which is a lack of self-awareness being present or being mindful if you're not even aware of what's going on you can't you then you can't self-manage them Again, that's why this, that's why if I say it once, I'll say it a thousand times. It's a skill you've got to practice. Um, this is another one of my controversial questions.
And I kind of touched on this question um, during our mindfulness practice. When I asked, when I said, well, if your mind's wandering, if you'd like to bring it back to your breathing or to your left shoulder, you can do that. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, as you think about the answer to this question, I want you to think about uh, the book. Vic I want you to think about Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Those of you that have read it, uh, there's a psychiatrist in Austria who survived the uh, Holocaust. And um, long story short, uh, and um, his thesis was the people that survived the Holocaust were the ones that understood that the only freedom that the Nazis couldn't take away from them was their, was their freedom of their mind. Um, oh, nice. I don't know who did that, but thank you. And the last thing. Uh, those of you that have ever heard of Admiral Stockdale, Admiral Stockdale, um, read a speech he talked about where, where of his time as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Um, and he became a, a big uh, um, studier of the Stoics and uh, Stoicism. And um, long story short, um, when he was asked, how did you survive nine years in North Vietnamese prison camp. And his answer was, um, I had a freedom that the uh, my North Vietnamese captives couldn't touch. And that was the freedom of the mind. So um, th I'll just leave that one. I love that question now. Uh, it's also for a lot of people, I'll say that it's an uncomfortable question. It's an uncomfortable question. Oftentimes I've, I've started the talk when I'll say, um, how often do you think about the price of apples in Latvia? And people will laugh at me like, what are you talking about? My response is, I'm, it's, a, I'm a, it's a serious question. When was the last time you thought about the price of apples in Latvia? Um, and their answer is never. I said, well, that, that's because it's not important. Um, so just a little bit more content. Again, this gets into the skill, metacognition. No matter where you are, you're at Starbucks, you're in the operating room, you're in a meeting. You're, you're, these are the, these are some of the questions you can ask yourself as you're sitting doing it, as you're being present, as you're practicing this skill. Ask yourself, what am I thinking right now? Well, I'm thinking about, you know, the uh, what I'm going to cook for dinner tomorrow. I mean, that would be okay if that's what you want to think about. Is that what I should be thinking about? Last point, Angie talked about these. There's a lot of science on mindfulness. There's a lot of science on presence. Um, there's a lot of science on the uh, power of the mind and how the mind can um, uh, heal and decrease stress and improve memory um, and reduce anxiety. Um, and a lot of the work with uh, PTS and PTSD is based on um, mind, the, the skill of mindfulness. And I'll just read one quick quote from a book by Ellen Langer out of uh, Harvard. The name of the book is Mindfulness. It's a great, she, there's a lot of research in her book. Page 179, she says, diseases thought to be purely physiological and incurable may be more amenable to individual, to individual control than we have believed in the past. Um, so the, again, it's the power of the mind. And do you own your own thinking? Um, I, I will just let you look at those, uh, that first question. It's, it's semi rhetorical. And I, I think there's an individual answer to that question. And then, uh, 
The second one is what coaches can use and mentors can use when they want to help teach, help people learn these skills. Different techniques to help prime people to be present. Um, some quick resources. And pending any questions or group discussion, I'm uh, Fran. I'll turn it over to you or Andy or someone a lot smarter than me. Hey, Joe, uh, before we go on, uh, there is a question from Laura. Okay. Uh, hey, Laura's got a question there. Any thoughts on advice uh, for personal roller coasters of anxiety during this time? Um, you know, of increased stress. <laughs> Laura, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Um, that's why the, that's why practicing this skill is so important because once you get better and better at, at, at owning this skill, then you can control the roller coaster that's going on in your mind. I mean, you have it, um, uh, Angie talked briefly. Was it Angie? Who was it that talked about positive psychology? Or no, no, it was Fran. Fran and the optimism and all the research from Marty Seligman at University of Pennsylvania on on learned optimism. Um, the the advice is to own your own thinking. And when you start going in, and when your mind starts going into places, Laura, where you don't want it to go, then then um, intentionally put it somewhere else. Um, the example that I give often is people who can't sleep at night, or if you wake up at night and your head, because you, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning and your head's spinning with anxiety, what should you do? Um, well, the first answer is a own your own thinking more specifically, maybe do the body scan technique, start thinking about your toes, then move up and slowly, slowly move up to your your ankles, your knees, anyways, it's called the body scan technique. Focusing on those areas of your body, just moving up. What are they feeling like? And nine times out of ten, by the time you're at your neck, you're going to be snoring. Um, I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but what else? Do any of you have resources that you ever had? You are trying to help them. Um, the best book on this topic, the most practical book on this topic, I would highly recommend, who just asked that question? That was, uh, Elizabeth. Can you guys see this book? It's called Attending Medicine, Mindfulness, and Humanity by Ron Epstein, who, oh, by the way, is going to be a guest speaker at the Fagan Leadership Forum, uh, Friday at 2.30 this Eastern time. This book is a great um, um, how to of all of these skills and the context happens to be medicine. I actually call this the best leadership book I've ever read. The context happens to be medicine, but it, it, it the skills apply regardless of context. Medicine, mindfulness, Attending Medicine, Mindfulness, and Humanity by Ron Epstein. He's uh, uh, he's at the University of Rochester. Okay, thanks, okay. Joe. I appreciate that, and I want to thank everybody for speaking. Before we get into uh, kind of a discussion, and we're looking at the public chat right now for any questions that we'll bring up. Uh, Andy, if we can bring up one slide. I did want to just point out, um, especially for my colleagues, Dean and Joe, who were so kind to help us with this AMSSM webinar, that this uh, Friday and Saturday is their Fagan Leadership Forum. This will be the first year it's actually going to be virtual. Uh, I've been to three of these meetings on leadership. They're outstanding uh, and great opportunities to learn more about leadership from leaders in business, uh, medicine, and the military. Dean, do you have anything to add to the particular a seminar that you're going to have this coming weekend? Yeah, friend. Well, first, uh, I, I just want to say thanks to everybody that that's being that that everyone that's on the webinar. Thank you for being here. Uh, you know, it's, 
you have uh, taken time out of your own uh, evening or late afternoon to, to be on this. And, and I see a lot of friends out there in the chat. So uh, first, thanks. Thanks for being here. Uh, the Fagan Leadership Forum is a, a two day, actually Friday afternoon, Saturday morning forum that brings together leaders from business, uh, academics, uh, military, uh, healthcare, athletics to share ideas about best practices and leadership. And the theme this year just happens to be on emotional intelligence. Um, and, uh, you know, I, the the importance of emotional intelligence in uh, this crisis, I think uh, we've we've emphasized in this webinar. And I, th I think it's going to be a fabulous uh, um, forum, probably the best ever. And as Fran said, this is the first time that we've opened it up. Usually we keep it a more intimate uh, by invitation only affair. Uh, consider this an invitation to all of you uh, to attend virtually and, and you can register by going to the Fagan Leadership website. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see many of you there. There's, uh, you'll see in that slide, some of our speakers uh, and there's some other ones that, that we haven't listed that are probably uh, uh, more famous and, and uh, we'll make some uh, surprise appearances. So you'll be, uh, you'll learn a lot, uh, I always do, and uh, it'll uh, be time well spent. Okay, thanks, Dean. While we're waiting uh, for some questions, I, I've got a question for you, Dean. Hey, before you do that, I saw a question yeah. from Laura because you know oh, okay. Joe was talking about um, you know how do we how do you uh, overcome the anxiety of of the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic? And uh, you know, when I think about uh, things that have helped me, I mean, you know, I shared the story about uh, you know how are things affecting you, and if you're focused on that. Uh, it can become a, a um, vicious cycle. And uh, so my point about uh, thinking about others and, and uh, what you can can do and what how the pandemic is affecting others um, in ways that you might be able to help others is a, a way to take your thinking off of that um, self-centeredness that, that Angie talked about, that uh, in, in times of high stress or, or crises, uh, we tend to to be very self-centered, and and uh, if you think about how is this affecting someone else, how can I help others? Uh, it it certainly helps reduce some of that that stress and anxiety, at least in my experience, and I've seen seen that in others. Uh, while at the same time, you have to recognize that that you need to take care of yourself. Uh, so it's a it's a balance, uh, and I'm not I'm not saying be totally selfless, but I think selfless service has its own rewards as long as you're taking care of yourself too. Angie, you may have something that you might, might wanna say about that. Can't find the thing, it's at the top. Andy, can you take me off of mute? There you go. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think I would just add, in addition to this concept of appraisal or our thoughts having so much control over our responses to the stressors in our environment, is the concept of control itself. And so during this time, especially with regard to Laura's question about the roller coaster, wanting to stay informed about things that are going on. Obviously, we don't necessarily want to stick our heads in the sand and, and uh, not pay attention to the news, but not oversaturating yourself with news stories and reading every article that comes out or being on social media constantly, that's going to contribute to the amount of stress that's added to everything else that's already going on. And so finding a newslet outlet that you trust or an entity that you trust that you'll get your news from so you can stay up to date, but then shutting down all of those other sources is going to limit some of that, uh, Ping ponging effect or roller coaster effect of uh, what's going on day to day. And further, you had asked about uh, teenagers, and uh, I really like Joe's comment about um, probably this is a good period in time with our kids, whether they're teenagers or they're younger. I think you may have seen my five year old pop in. She's supposed to be in bed. Um, but is 
refocusing on our interactions. And so this concept of emotional intelligence isn't just for those that we work with or those that we lead, but also for those people who live in our home, whether they're our spouse or partner or our children, and really thinking about, okay, how's this affecting them? For example, I have a 10-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl, and we've figured out through all of this that they emote and cope and get stressed a lot like me. Uh, they're very, they're emotional about it. They want to eat ice cream all day. Uh, they don't want to go to bed because there's some anxiety about tomorrow looking exactly the same and, and being Groundhog's Day. My husband doesn't get it because he's a total introvert. And he's totally okay with riding out what's going on, doing home projects. And so as parents, we look at that and say, how, how am I feeling inside? Is, is how they're reacting to this, is how is what their behavior, how they're carrying this out, the fact that they don't want to eat broccoli, but they just want to eat cookies all day. Is that related to how they're experiencing the stress? And you might find that you have an opportunity to really go deep with your kids in relationship and in conversations about their feelings and how they're interacting uh, with, with this situation. And, and I think mostly giving ourselves a break and giving others a break during this time, not having uh, ridiculous expectations for what we're going to be able to get done is another way to reduce the overall anxiety and controlling things that we can control. Hey, Angie, uh, there was a great question. I opened this up to the whole group from uh, Elliot out in California. You know, what are methods to motivate those in leadership positions to practice these principles? Because all of us are going to have challenges with different leaders and I know, Angie, we're really focusing at the university now only about leadership, but also followership and how critical that is as well. I was wondering if everybody could kind of comment on that because we all have challenge with different leaders. Am I supposed to go first? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think that I love that emotional intelligence was included in this seminar, and I, I love how much Joe talks about it from a skill perspective, because if we look at it from a skill, a skill perspective and not a personality or something about the individual, then we really can work to increasing it in ourselves and in others. And uh, I did. So I think Laura's question was also or someone had a question about what are some uh, methods for helping our followers to increase in their emotional intelligence? I did put two links in uh, in the chat that we use uh, when we're teaching it. So so with regard to those that we work for or those we're working with, uh, that sometimes we're required to lead up. And so understanding, and I really, I know, because this is being recorded, I don't want to necessarily equate uh, my bosses with my five-year-old, but uh, kind of applying the same rules in those contexts. So regardless of who it is or what position they're in, really trying to see them and see their situation for what it is. And, and I think that this uh, experience while there's a lot of crisis and there's a lot of problems is really an opportunity to increase our empathy for each other. And when we do that, that's going to increase our ability to interact. And so uh, with, as a good follower, I think that one, understanding the expectations of those that we're working with or working for. And then when we're not meeting those expectations or when there seems to be some kind of friction, stopping, taking that strategic pause or tactical pause, figuring out our contributions to where's the other person? What are our contributions to this conversation? What are what is my contribution to the disconnect here? And then how can I go about reconciling that? And uh, and then always choose, choose your battles. I think is a is a is a good um, a mantra during this time as well. Yeah, I'd just add, uh, leading up is a, is a huge challenge. And I think Angie's insights are, are great there. Uh, and, and frequently, one of the best ways to uh, influence up uh, is to ask questions, uh, not non-judgmentally. Um, to use, use Joe's uh, terminology. And, and if you're asking questions and are, are genuinely curious about why things are being done, that's, that's going to uh, go a long way. Uh, and, and, um, and, and sometimes that's hard to do because you may have your own um, thoughts about what you think is right. Uh, but if you're genuine, genuinely curious about it, I think uh, it helps you come to a better understanding and it really improves um, 
the ability to influence and also the, those relationships. It's great uh, relationship management. I just, I, want to, I just want to add like four asterisks what Dean just said. I mean, that that is how, that's how you do it. That's how you lead up, especially with uh, uh, problem children, uh, uh, bosses. Um, ask a lot of, ask a lot of very genuine, um, curious, understanding, trying to help me understand um, questions. Um, that is a very, very powerful technique. And when you think about it in the military context, you know, way back in the second lieutenant days, when, when, you know, where we had to role, at least, you know, there was some role playing when, if you're ever given an illegal order, what are you supposed to do when you get, when you, when the superior gives you an order that you think is illegal? You know, besides obviously not doing it, a technique that, that um, can be role played for young people is asking the boss, sir, let me make, let me make sure I understand what you're asking me to do and, 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 and repeat his order back um, to him or her and see what they say. So that's, um, I just wanted to pile on or reinforce what Dean and really what Angie was saying in, in terms of leading up. Hey, to the group, uh, you know, Devin McFadden had a great question. I don't know if you saw this about, but that could mindfulness come at the expense of instinct? And I you look at Kolditz's book, talking about that elite leader who has the ability to perceive ahead what's happening and be able to adapt. Um, and I think Devin's questioning, uh, you know, could mindfulness actually make you take a step backwards or is it mindfulness at its best? Uh, Dean, Joe, Angie, what do you think about Devin's question? I'll leave that one to the smart people. See, if I start talking right now, then that suggests that I think I'm smart or smarter. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to start talking. <laughs> I'll start. Um, Devin, great question. That question, that question always comes up. Um, basically, Fran just answered it. Um, when, um, especially in the human performance um, literature and elite athletes and elite soldiers, um, when they are, or, you know, all the stuff in, in uh, Tom Kolditz's book, when they are at the height of, of mindfulness, when they are um, acting on um, instinct, if you want to, I, I don't really like the word flow um, in terms of athletics, but for um, our special operations forces. Um, but you know, you, you say a um, muscle memory kicks in, that's what, or, or go to autopilot. It's all at, at the, it's, it's actually the highest level of mindfulness. You're, they are as focused as they could possibly be. There are zero distractions going on. And I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, but, or I'm not a surgeon at all, but I would argue when someone's deep into someone's shoulder or better yet, deep into someone's taking out a tumor from somebody's brain, um, I would argue that they are at, they are at the height of um, human performance and mindfulness. That's yeah, Joe. I would just add here. I just got a text from uh, the boss and uh, you know General Schumacher, who totally confirms. I think what you said and what I said that uh, uh, you know instinct is really mindfulness at its best. That you are totally honed in. Uh, I want to flip it here, and I, I was going to get back to a question for Dean. You know, Dean, we talked a little bit about uh, emotional intelligence and empathy. And uh, I know I was rather thin on empathy, uh, but I take a look at empathy really needed at this point because we're in a marathon here. This is not going to be a short race. This is going to be a marathon event. Um, what's the difference between empathy and emotional intelligence? You know, if I'm emotionally intelligent, I understand somebody else, how they're walking in their shoes. Uh, how is that distinct from empathy? How do you see the distinction there? Well, I think emotional uh, empathy is a is a component of emotional intelligence, Brian. I, I think that um, before you can effectively have those relationships, 
uh, and, and work with other people or to, to optimize that, um, you have to understand them. Uh, and put, being able to put yourself in someone else's position and, and try and understand their point of view, that's going to Im- improve that social awareness. Uh, and once you have that, then then you can build off of that. And you can't get to that before you have your own self-awareness um, and then your own self-management. So it's it's a building block. So Joe's, Joe's uh, presentation on mindfulness uh, and so your your uh, self awareness that's the starting point, and then how you manage yourself is is part of empathy. I mean, it, it, you have to be able to manage yourself to put yourself in the position to want to be empathetic. Some people have have these skills naturally, and most of us have to work at it and, and build. Uh, but uh, you know, when I think about uh, John Fagan, he had a lot of these skills naturally, but he 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 developed them and practiced them. Um, you know, he had the highest uh, emotional quotient of anybody that that I've ever met, um, and uh, he would put himself in other pe- people's um, shoes and and make them feel like they were the most important person that they were talking to. You hear this story repeatedly. Uh, and and that was a skill that he had that that building on his self awareness, self management, his social awareness, and that empathy then allowed him to have all of those relationships, in uh, those deep relationships, and that relationship management. And it just came natural to him. Um, I think for the rest of us, uh, it, it's not always natural, and it's it's uh, uh, always a work in progress. Can I, um, that, that's, that's a phenomenal question. Um, and Dean's first thing that he said was it's simply a, it's one of the behaviors of being, of an emotionally intelligent person. So if you think about role playing it, Fran, if, 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 if I'm talking to someone and they're, and they are, if I'm having a conversation with, let's say an employee and they're talking about their child being sick or they're, they were in a car wreck and they're, they need to get their car fixed. If they're sharing something, empath- the, the skill of empathy, first of all, if I'm not even listening to them or I'm trying to focus on the next meeting I'm going to, that right there is a complete lack of either self-awareness or self-management. And so if, if I want to practice the skill of empathy while this human being is talking to me, it's an intentional purpose. It's a, it's a skill you have to practice. Joe, you need to really pay attention to what he or she is saying. Don't start thinking about what the next thing is you're going to say. Don't start talking, oh, well, I, well, my dog was in, my dog's very sick too. Let me tell you about my dog. They don't want to hear about your dog. They're telling you about their dog. So again, that's, uh, you know, that's an example of the skill of self-awareness, self-management. Res- Leading to empathy. Hey, Angie, I, I had a question for you as well. Um, you know, you talked about something that I think a lot of us worry about. Is that under stress, that dominant trait is going to come out? You know, that we might narrow our vision or we might be angry or short or turn to individuals. How, how do you recognize that and how do you train yourself out of it? Uh, that you might have more favorable traits in a period of stress. You've had the experience being an instructor at West Point. I'm just wondering, how do we train that? How do we recognize it and train it? Well, the short answer is practice. And and that might seem strange because we want to say, uh, or at least we have this perception, or, or a lot of people, especially those who don't study leadership, have this perception that leaders and good leaders are inherently good at it, that there's nothing that they really do. There's nothing that they study. There's nothing that they practice to get better. And those of us who work in the business of leader development know that that's not true at all, that in fact, there's a series of skills and competencies that can be honed. And so responses under stress are absolutely uh, fall into that category. And and because our business is about interactions with other humans, uh, especially under stressful conditions, even if we're not stressed, sometimes our followers or our teammates are going to be the ones that, that are experiencing stress. And so being able to 
And and I love, again, that we're talking about self-awareness and mindfulness because that's really is the first step is paying attention to your responses in certain situations. So, for example, if if you're a leader and you're inclined to be defensive uh, when receiving pushback or criticism from a subordinate and the way you might know this is someone told you. (laughs) So that's the easiest is 360 evaluation or something. You know that that's a trait that you have and you're working on it. Uh, Or a good friend has told you or something. Hopefully it's within your awareness. So you're, you're aware of it. If you're not, and, but you're interested to improve your interpersonal interactions, then that's where you start. Start paying attention to how you're being received by others. What do their facial expressions look like? What are their responses to you? Uh, if they're a teammate and they're also getting defensive, then start to look inward first and identify what is it in my behavior that potentially I could do differently. And so Back to the example, if that's something that happens, you get defensive when when receiving criticism, then the way to practice is to be in those environments, be in those situations in which you're likely to be in those interpersonal interactions and not respond at all first. So if you're trying to dismantle or unpack a dominant response, the first step is to really get yourself to not respond at all and and see how it changes. That might sound strange and I can't really speak to specific situations necessarily, but uh, that's the place. And then once you start to pay more attention to how people are receiving you, then you have an opportunity to try out various various behaviors, various responses, and, and then practice the ones that seem to work. And I can give an example, and it's it's related to uh, the conversation you were just having about empathy and increasing um, empathy with our followers. So I am a problem solver. I, as a leader, want to fix everybody's problems. So the moment they bring it to me, I'm going to give them 15 ways to solve it. Or at least I used to be that way. Uh, I was able to hone this skill at West Point. In fact, as you had just mentioned, coming from, uh, I was an instructor there for two years and had a lot of great interactions with cadets and found most of the time when they're bringing an issue to me, they just want to be heard and they don't necessarily want any advice. They just need someone to talk to. And I'm not a clinician by training, so that didn't come naturally to me, but I had to practice not responding at all. Not responding with the how to fix it, but instead saying, hmm, that really sucks, or oh, I can't imagine what it would be like to be in that situation, which was not natural for me. I wanted to say, well, you can do something differently this way. And just over and over again, paying attention to the way that was received by my students, by my teammates, it it made it really obvious that that was the way to go. And then just to continue to practice that. Thanks, Angie. Hey, uh, Dean, I got a great question online, you know, uh, from a colleague that I've known for a long time. Uh, And he kind of challenged my hope paradigm just a little bit with regards to optimism. You know, an optimism is a force multiplier, but it's got to be balanced with honesty. Uh, I think we've all had some of those leaders that just rah, rah, let's go and we can do it. But we also need the realists. And uh, whether it's pessimism or honesty, it has to balance optimism. How do you, how do you balance that? Um, have you ever addressed that at the Fagan Leadership Program? You know, honesty, optimism versus reality? Sure. I, I mean, Joe touched on that. That's the Stockdale paradox. Uh, essentially is what you're talking about. Uh, Understanding the realities of the situation while uh, also uh, committing your mind to to, uh, that you're going to overcome those realities uh, and and staying in the moment. Uh, Yeah, I think there's a difference between optimism and positivity. Uh, So, uh, you know, I think being realistically optimistic, uh, it doesn't always mean that you're going to be positive about things, but uh, uh, I think it, it's it's looking that uh, you're going to succeed despite the the circumstances, and and that's what what Stockdale uh, uh, the Stockdale paradox essentially is. Um, and and Jim Collins writes uh, in his book Good to Great really. Um, 
goes into depth about that. And, and uh, that's a, a sign of great leadership and, and uh, uh, great organizations when they, they understand um, the realities and, and at the same time um, are committed to uh, uh, succeeding uh, no matter what the realities are. Thanks, Dean. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time left, uh, so I'm just going to kind of go around the horn to see if there was anything else anyone wanted to share. Uh, any final thoughts? And I guess I'll start, uh, Dean, with you. Anything else you want to share uh, before we end the uh, the webinar? Well, first, it, it, this has been great, Fran, and thank you for for organizing it. Uh, I think you, you know this is important. Uh, I think. The, the members of the AMSSM, uh, thank you for for being on on board here. You've got some some real challenges. So, Joe, these are these are not surgeons. They're much smarter than surgeons. These are are real sports medicine doctors that that uh, uh, are taking care of uh, uh, problems, uh, and and many of them are are taking care of the realities of uh, treating uh, uh, patients with the coronavirus and and. Uh, uh, I think uh, there was a couple questions on here about what what should we do in our, our leadership roles, and and I think that that's something that I've struggled with because because we've all want we all want to do something we all want want to contribute to to uh, this crisis, uh, and and the challenge is not to do too much and get in the way, um, and and not to do too little. Uh, so you have to figure out where your skill set is, how you can contribute in, in a way that's positive uh, for your organization, uh, for society, uh, and it's gonna be different for everybody. So identifying um, those, um, those challenges that, that meet your skill set and in, in where you are, uh, I think everyone has a leadership role and we all should find uh, what that role is and uh, attack it. And the time to develop your leadership skills is always uh, so that uh, you're prepared for, for times of crisis like this. Okay, uh, Joe? I just, I just typed mine in. <laughs> um, my final thoughts, practice, practice, practice. And don't forget, it's always right now. So choose what you want to choose what you want to do with right now. Okay, and uh, Angie, uh, final thoughts. Those are really great points. I also wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to present on the panel and to be uh, spending some time with this really elite group. Really appreciate it. Uh, my final thoughts are related to one of the questions I saw in the chat on how do we fit this all into our busy schedule? And I think if you if you look at my coping slide and about seven different things that you could potentially do and automatically think, well, I have to do all of those to get a really deep wellness bank, you've just created more stress for yourself. And so I think that if you can focus on one of those that you're already pretty good at and just be more intentional about it, to Joe's point, practice it, add it in there, practice what, figure out one that you wanna get better at um, and don't have an expectation, you know, exercise. Don't have an expectation you're going to be a marathon runner. Maybe start by going out for a walk. Um, maybe just start by doing some sit-ups. So th the key would be don't incur additional stress by attempting to integrate some of these stress management uh, things into your, to your daily practice. Start small. All habits start really small. Practice. And uh, again, I really appreciate being here. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And I, actually, I see one last question, if we've got a quick second for this, because this is from our administrative director, uh, Jim Griffith. Uh, I'm going to read this question. It's a great question, Jim. I uh, just read an article about a 40-team youth baseball tournament already being played this weekend. Uh, what pearls can you share for sports medicine physicians being turned to for community leadership guidance about these kind of decisions? And I know many of us are on task forces right now wrestling with tough decisions, uh, but what kind of guidance for a physician to ask to chime in? Uh, and I'll start with you there, Dr. Taylor. Uh, well, I, I'm just going to say, just remember Fran's acronym, HOPE. 
just remember Fran's acronym HOPE. And, and be, Fran, you probably have a better uh, better sense of answering that question than any of us because you you are the expert in, in uh, uh, developing uh, on-site uh, medical coverage. So I think you should tackle that one. Okay. Uh, Angie or Joe, do you have a comment on that one? Joe? Angie? Those are my thoughts exactly. I think this is a great question for oh, okay. All right. All right. Well, I think the most important thing that I have learned and that I would say here um, is what I emphasized right up front with the uh, Fritch article in that uh, in these periods of crisis where it's a marathon, it's about a team making a decision. And because uh, you can't have one single choke, choke point, one decision maker, and that physician shouldn't think that he or she is making that decision. They're part of a team, they're bringing that information forward, and it's gonna be a group decision. Uh, the only way we're gonna get through this, uh, I believe, is through team leadership, and we've gotta understand our role uh, as, as contributors to that team. Dean, does that work for you? Absolutely, Fran. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody for participating, especially- uh, Break is one. <laughs> and my colleagues from Duke, and please don't forget about the Fagan Leadership Program. I think you'll uh, greatly enjoy it. So uh, signing out. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Have a great night.